tell you how impressed I am by the truth that the Song of Solomon is such a strange book in the Bible. If we had no knowledge of it and we discovered it in some Raiders of the Lost Ark ancient crypt under the ground, nobody would think of putting it in the Bible because it doesn't speak directly much about the Lord at all. Now, indirectly and by inference, yes, much. And calling itself the Song of Songs. Please remember what that title is all about. It means the ultimate song, the best song, the greatest song ever. The Song of Songs is not, in the Bible, a song of praise to God. Now, we love praising God. We love praising the Lord with Joseph and the worship team and Andrea and the team. We love to do that in song, and we think it's wonderful that the Lord gives us the opportunity. Praise the Lord for that. But, but, isn't it fascinating that the Bible itself tells us that the song of songs is primarily focused on romantic love between a husband and a wife? Not just the practice of it, but also the anticipation of it. And in these early chapters of the Song of Solomon, it's all about the anticipation of it. As I explained to you before, the Song of Solomon is essentially snapshots of the life of this couple. Some of the snapshots come before they're married. Some of them come from the wedding. Some of them come from after they're married. Some of them come before the wedding, but in anticipation of it, and so forth and so on. So tonight... We're going to take a look at a couple other snapshots, and we don't really feel compelled to rush our way through the Song of Solomon, so we're only going to take a look at chapter 3 this evening, Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I should just pause right here. Perhaps in your Bible, there's headings to the sections saying who's speaking, the beloved, sometimes the Shulamite, um, whatever. You might wonder, how do they know that? Those titles aren't in the ancient Hebrew text. But what is there is by the grammar of Hebrew, because they use masculine pronouns and feminine pronouns and masculine nouns and feminine nouns and stuff like that. By the grammar of the ancient Hebrew, they can tell who is speaking when. So what we know here. This is the maiden speaking. And she's probably speaking in another dream sequence. Maybe not, we don't know for sure, but it seems to me like this might be another one of her dreams or daydreams like we saw in chapter two. Okay, back to the beginning of verse one. By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will rise now, I said, and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who go about the city found me. I said, have you seen the one I love? Here, the maiden begins by saying, by night on my bed, I sought the one I love. The maiden, and again, whether this was, you know, actually happening or whether it was a dream that she had or whether it's just a a, a poetic creation. But the scene we have is of the maiden waking in the middle of the night and instantly feeling alone. And she's longing for her beloved. She wants her man and she seeks him out, but she could not find him anywhere in the house. She wakes up and she's like, where, where's my beloved? I want to be with him. So she says, I'm going to find him. Now again, I believe that this snapshot probably records another dream or daydream of the maiden, as in the previous chapter. Because at the end of this little section, the maiden is going to speak to her companions. And if this were sort of a reporting of a scene, it's unlikely that the companions would be there. Since this is likely another dream or daydream, it doesn't matter if the maiden speaks of this as a married woman or a yet-to-be married woman. She has the longings of a married woman, whether or not she has the ring on her finger yet. You see, what she wants is she wants to share a home and a bed with her beloved. Now, 
everything we have from the text of Ecclesiastes, excuse me, of Song of Solomon tells us, she didn't act on those longings until the wedding, but she had them and they were real. By the way, these are longings for a bed, not just in the sense of a place to sleep. This particular Hebrew word for bed shows that the maiden was filled with sexual longing. Why do I say that? Well, because this is the only place in the entire Song of Solomon where this particular Hebrew word for bed is used. And in at least three other places in the Old Testament, the word has a definite sexual connotation. So she, she wants the marriage bed with her beloved. By the way, I, I can't think of this connotation of the marriage bed as it's indicated here in Song of Solomon chapter 3 without thinking of that same context in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 is one of the most interesting passages. It's a very brief statement, but a very instructive statement in the New Testament on sexual relations in marriage. This is what it says. It says, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. The, the basic idea there is God is communicating that God discourages and even condemns as sin sex outside the marriage commitment. That's in the line, fornicators and adulterers God will judge. But at the same time, God absolutely celebrates sexual love within the commitment of marriage. As indicated in Hebrews 13, 4, and also as it indicated in the Song of Solomon. Throughout the entire, the, the, the whole book is a celebration of sexual and romantic love in the married relationship. But let me just let you ponder on that just for a moment. Isn't it so clearly one of the great strategies of Satan, and I don't just mean in our modern culture, I mean throughout all time, one of the great strategies of Satan to encourage every destructive practice of sexuality and discourage every valid and wonderful and affirming and strengthening expression of sexuality within the marriage. That, that's just how he, he wants to encourage it where it's damaging and discourage it where it has healing and power and beauty before God. In any regard, look at the heart of the maiden in verse one. What does she say? I sought him, but I did not find him. The maiden always longed for her beloved and wanted him close, yet now in the middle of the night, she felt this longing more intensely. She felt alone and she longed for the presence of her beloved, and so she imagined herself seeking after him. I think there's something so powerful in the depiction of this maiden. She's a remarkable character. She allowed herself to feel needy without feeling helpless. Some of us, men and women, we are so on guard against allowing ourselves to feel needy in any way. We're just kind of the super men or women and we're invulnerable to those things. No way, not this maiden. She admits that she's a needy woman, yet at the same time, she is not helpless. She, she felt that she needed her beloved. She didn't foster some artificial sense of self-sufficiency. She didn't feel like it was a bad thing for her to say, I need my beloved. And so there's something good in her seeking of her beloved. Although, may I say, we would say that properly speaking, this is once the relationship is well established. She's not a stalker after a stranger. This is a longing for, for companionship with the one that she knows and loves so much. So what does she do? Look at it right there in verse two. It's actually quite striking. She says, I will rise and go about the city. I will seek the one I love. I sought him. She emphasizes the urgency and the depth of her seeking. She, she's saved. She's going to go out and seek under the watchman of the city, but she can't help but go out and seek after her beloved. One other thing I want you to notice here, and it's really kind of striking. If you look in the first three verses, do you see the repetition of the way that she speaks of her beloved? Verse one, the one I love. Uh, verse two, the one I love. Verse three, it ends with the one I love over and over again. This is how she thinks of 
her beloved. Again, the one that I love. So what happens? Verse 4. Look, she's going to find her beloved. Scarcely had I passed by them, the watchmen, she means, when I found the one I love. I held him and I would not let him go until I had brought him to the house of my mother and into the chamber of her who conceived me. So verse 4 says that her search, and again, it's kind of most logical to think this happening in a dream. Her search for her beloved. She went out. Where is he? She go out. It's the middle of the night. The watchmen of the city are all around until she finds her beloved. And what happens when she finds the one she loves? Again, it's repeated a fourth time in four verses. The one I love. The one I love. The one I love. And so what does she do? Did you see that in verse four? When she finds her beloved, what's her response? I held him and I would not let him go. Now, it's easy to picture the relieved maiden clinging to her beloved. Now she feels calm. She feels secure in his embrace. And I just love that phrase there in verse 4. She would not let him go. Again, my, my mind is always running to biblical connections. And when I read about a woman grabbing onto her beloved and saying, I will not let him go. I think about what happened in John chapter 20. When Mary saw Jesus presuming him to be the gardener after his resurrection, sir, I don't know where they put the body. Can you tell me? And as soon as Jesus said her name, as soon as he said Mary in that particular, she knew it was Jesus. And so what did she do? She, she grabbed on him so much so that Jesus told her, and this is how it is literally in Hebrew, woman, stop grabbing on me. You got to let me go. I have to ascend to my father sometime. You know, it's like, I am never letting you go, Jesus, ever, ever again out of my sight. And I imagine Jesus saying almost with a laugh, you know, I do got to ascend to my father in, you know, 40 days. You, you can't hold on to me forever here. But this is, this is the heart of the maiden in the Song of Solomon. She's like, I-, I felt so lost. I felt so alone. But I am going to hang on to you. Now, in either interpreting or applying this section of the Song of Solomon, preachers through the centuries and commentators have wanted to apply this little vignette to the life of the believer with Jesus. You know, just sort of as a spiritual application. But I think there's something very beautiful there telling us that in the life of the believer, when you have a sense of separation from the Lord, you need to go seek after him. You you need to go seek him. And sometimes... Maybe I should say many times, believers don't have this attitude. They sense a distance between them and the Lord. That that, that there's been a cooling in their relationship between them and their Savior. And, And I don't know if I need to describe it any more than that. If you've experienced it, and I think if you've walked with the Lord with any amount of time, you know what I'm talking about. But when you sense this, this cooling of the relationship that you have with the Lord. When you sense, we're not as close as we used to be, sometimes the reaction of the believer is, well, you know what? Here I am. If Jesus ever wants to come and get me, here I am. The, The maiden's example here shows us something about our own relationship with the Lord, that our passion should be. Jesus, I'm gonna find you. I'm gonna seek you out. I'm gonna search all around the house. And if you're not around the house, I'm gonna go out into the city and I'm gonna find you. And when I find you, I'm gonna grab onto you and not let go. This is really kind of a beautiful, poetic illustration of that. I like what G. Campbell Morgan said about this. He said, when either in a dream or in reality, we lose our sense of his presence, let us search for him. And then in the finding, with new devotion, let us hold him and refuse to let him go. I I like that picture. I think it's very instructive for us in our walk with Jesus himself. I want to take pains. I don't think that's the main point of what's being spoken here. But it's an interesting illustration of a spiritual truth that I think is important for us. 
So the maiden seeks after her beloved. She finds him. She grabs onto him. But then did you see the next line in verse 4? It's a little bit awkward, don't you think? I find this awkward. Until I had brought him to the house of my mother. It's a little awkward. I found you. Let's go back to mom's house and make out. It's like, what? What? Mom said, could you find a better place than that? No, actually... This is very important, and it's very significant. The maiden dreamed of bringing her beloved home with her to be together with him and to enjoy the intimacy of, notice, the chamber of her mother's home. And you might say to us, well, how do we really know that she's talking about her mother? I don't know. Verse 4, into the chamber of her who conceived me. I think that's pretty, you know, clear. Mom. Let's go back to mom's house. What's going on with this? Well, still clinging to her beloved. That's essentially what she says. Let's go together to my mother's house and let's be close together. But the fact that it is the house of her mother shows that she expected this to be when they were in fact married and not some premarital sexual rendezvous. She's not looking for an illicit consummation of their love. She wants it to be consummated. It's as if she says to her beloved, I I want this, but I only want it so pure and so right before God that we could do it at my mother's house. That's a beautiful heart. I I really appreciate uh, this particular quote from a man named Dennis Kinlaw. Uh, We'll put it up on the screen for you. It says, she says, or Dennis Kinlaw says in this, she is not looking for an illicit consummation of their love. Consummation she wants, but even in her dream, she wants the consummation to be right. Where in human literature does one find a text so erotic, yet so moral as this? And that's one of the things that just stuns me over and over again about the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is way too celebrative of sexual love for the uptight traditionalist in religion and the the legalist. Way too celebrative of it. So what do they do? Well, it has to just be about Jesus and his people because there's no way that God could really want people to be that happy and excited about a sexual relationship. It offends the religious traditionalist, the legalist. But but it also offends the the person who doesn't have a moral foundation. Because this isn't just a wild, and excuse my words, it's not exactly, it's not some wild sex party. This is no, we want it to be right. I want you so badly, but I only want you in the context that it's so right before God that we could go back to my mother's house. That's really something powerful and beautiful. Now, before we leave this brief section here uh, and and just talk about the the next verse that kind of ends the section, let me tell you one other application that Charles Spurgeon made about this idea that the maiden spoke the words, that she held him and would not let him go. Spurgeon wanted to make the point spiritually by analogy that Jesus must be held or his presence may seem to drift away from us. He said, if you are willing to lose Christ's company, he's never intrusive. He will go away from you and leave you until you know his value and until you begin to long for him. I go, says Jesus, and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. He will go unless you hold him. And what this kind of shows us, again, I'm drawing the spiritual application here, is that Jesus must be held. He he may at least appear to go. I don't mean that he'll forsake us, but the dear nearness of his presence will not be the same unto us. But it also shows us Jesus is willing to be held. He won't try to escape us. I suppose it's a somewhat common phenomenon in relationships 
for one person to not like the other person in the relationship, and I could go either way between the man and the woman, but it's common, they don't want him to feel clingy to him. Don't cling on to me. You know, Jesus is never like that towards his people. Could you imagine Jesus saying to any one of us or any of his beloved, hey, don't cling on to me. You know, back off. You're getting a little too close here. Jesus would never say that. So Jesus is willing to be held. But, but Jesus can be held. We really can grasp onto him by faith. And Jesus himself must be held. We're not talking about a creed. We're not talking about a tradition. We're not talking about a ceremony. We're talking about Jesus himself in real relationship with him. So in the midst of this beautiful and powerful passage, the maiden calls out again, and now she's speaking to her companions. And this is the section that kind of makes me think that this may be, I can't say positively, a dream description or a daydream, because she speaks to her own companions in verse 5, and she says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Uh, again, it, it seems weird. Let's go back to mom's house, and then there's the chorus of the daughters of Jerusalem waiting for them there. It, it just, again, it seems like it's a poetic description here. Uh, what does it mean where she says, I charge you by the gazelles or the does of the field? What does it mean? I don't know. Just, you got me. I, I assume it's some sort of poetic reference that would have made sense in the ancient culture. Uh, by the way, it's not that I haven't read explanations of them, but none of them really seem to me to be all that great. So I think that's just one of the things we say, well, it probably made a lot more sense to them than it does to us. But notice the phrase that ends verse five. It's the second time in the Song of Solomon already that we've encountered it. Do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. As in the previous time that this phrase was used, this idea can be understood in two senses. The general meaning is it says, don't let my dream be interrupted. But it can also be understood in the context of relationship and in passion. In relationship to say, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. In relationship, it says, let our love progress and grow until it's matured and fruitful, making a genuinely pleasing relationship. In terms of relationship, that statement means don't go too fast. But in terms of passion, this statement means let our lovemaking continue without interruption until we're both fulfilled. Don't start until we can go all the way. If we're not ready morally, socially, rightfully before God, if we're not ready to go all the way, then don't even start up with it. Because we don't want to awaken love until it can really please. It's a powerful statement. All right, that kind of concludes the first snapshot. Let's take a look at the second one in chapter three. Now we have the spectacular arrival of the wedding party. And look, I, I think sometimes we try to understand the Song of Solomon too much. I, I think in some ways it's maybe just a very impressionistic book. And we're just supposed to read and go, whoa, wow. So, so commentators love to, to discuss, is this second half of chapter three, is this actual description of the wedding that will be fulfilled in chapter four, and we'll take a look at that next week, or is this a continuation of the maiden dreaming or daydreaming? I don't know. It could go either way. She, she could actually be describing the arrival of the wedding party because next chapter, chapter four, that we'll take a look at next week, the, the, the marriage is consummated, next chapter. But, but here, maybe the wedding party's around, or again, maybe she's continuing on the daydream. It really doesn't matter either way. But look at what she says, starting out verse six. Who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, preferred with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchant's fragrant powders? Behold, it is Solomon's couch, with 60 valiant men around it of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. Now, when we first read verse six, look at that first line. Who is this coming out of the wilderness? 
and we hear about it being Solomon's couch, a lot of times we think, oh, well, this is Solomon. Solomon coming with a great, Solomon's a king. I, I mean, the guy travels with a great big posse. He's got his secret service. He, he's got all these guys with him. He's got, you know, all the, the bodyguards. He's got everything around. I mean, yeah, this is Solomon. But what's interesting about it is verse six in the Hebrew is in the feminine. So what this seems to be is the maiden arriving in Solomon's limo. The maiden arriving with Solomon's crew, with his entourage, with his posse all around her. But it's the maiden who is arriving. That's indicated by the feminine of verse 6. So when it says, who is this? The answer is, the maiden is arriving in Solomon's palanquin for the wedding described at the end of the chapter. What's a palanquin? Oh, hold on, we'll talk about it later. Now, verse 6, it says, it's coming like pillars of smoke, perfumed. It adds to the idea of the dignity and the impressive character of Solomon's entourage which is being given over to the maiden to bring her to the wedding. She's rejoicing in it. And it's coming complete with, notice in verse 7, the valiant of Israel. And who's around it? Look at verse 7. 60 valiant men around it. Can you see that scene? You know, you think of guys, you know, with bare shoulders and big muscles and they got swords and they look like scary guys that you wouldn't. And 60 guys are marching all around this palanquin, this litter that's being carried. And there's the maiden right in the middle of it. It seems so wonderful and so great. They weren't there, those 60 valiant men. They weren't there to keep Solomon from backing out of the wedding. Those 60 valiant men were there to prove this is a powerful man who's going to use his power to protect his maiden. That's a pretty awesome thought. Number one, that Solomon's a powerful man and he doesn't mind letting it show. But secondly, he's going to use that power for something. And that power is going to be used to make the woman he loves feel safe and protected. Therefore, the maiden has no need to worry, as the text says, in the fear of the night, because she's coming with the one. She's coming with her beloved. And this is the point, and this is so powerful by this picture of the maiden arriving on Solomon's entourage. He's not even there. But he says, you take my limousine, you take my bodyguards, you take my attendants, it's all yours. Do you see what he is saying to the maiden? What I have belongs to you. I am a man of power and authority, and I share that with you. There's no division between the two of them. It's not like she comes in as some kind of lesser junior partner into the whole equation. No way. You're coming into this marriage as my maiden, then everything I have, everything I'll be, it's ours together. Isn't that a powerful statement of oneness and unity in the marriage? Th those aren't my 60 valiant men, Solomon says. They're yours because everything I have is yours. Everything I will be, it's ours together. And this expresses the oneness of life and the shared life that should exist between husband and wife. One of the most important and powerful principles that a husband, that the beloved like Solomon should keep in mind all the time is that all that he is, all that he has, it's for them together. And so again, whatever power God has given you, do, do you use that power to protect and give a sense of security to the one you love? Whatever uh, resources or assets, maybe they're humble, but at least that wife knows they're ours together. I, I, I don't mean to talk about anybody's financial arrangements, because I don't know. And believe me, probably I don't want to know. But, but I kind of don't get it if, if uh, husband and wife keep financial accounts separate. The, the, the husband should make it very clear. Now, again, 
I don't even know what I'm talking about. There, there might be valid reasons for doing it. But in principle, it always has to be there. Whatever I have is yours. It's all ours together. That's what Solomon is communicating to his maiden. Now, can I go off on a little spiritual excursion here? Spurgeon is leading me off on another spiritual excursion here. Spurgeon looked at this scene with the 60 valiant men. Do you have the picture of the 60 bodybuilders with their swords and spears around the palanquin, walking all around? Do you have that picture in mind? Spurgeon said, using the scripture as a spiritual application, that the fears people have about God's church on this earth, they don't need to have those fears. That God has assigned his own valiant men in every generation to protect his work, and we don't have to be afraid. This is what Spurgeon described the fear as. All good men are dead. There are none left to guard the churches before. Yet he showed by symbolic application, number one, that there are enough guards for the church. Don't you think 60 valiant men for one woman on a little litter are enough? And that they're valiant guards for the church. And that the guards in the church are in the right places. They're all around the church. And he says that the guards of the church are well armed. They're well trained. They're always ready. And that they're watchful. I thought, what a beautiful picture Spurgeon's painting there of these 60 valiant men representing how God knows how to take care of his work from generation to generation. Now, you have the scene of the maiden coming in on Solomon's entourage. Now look at verse 9. Out of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon the king made himself a palanquin. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and see King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. So what does verse 9 say? Solomon the king made himself a palanquin. Now, let, let's go right here. What's a palanquin? You know what a palanquin is. It's one of those things that you got a group of guys on one side and a group of guys on the other side, and they carry one of those. Did you even know that that was called a palanquin? That's what it is, right there, a palanquin. That's what we have to deal with. So what I love about this whole scene in the Song of Solomon, it's like the maiden sees Solomon's entourage come with his limousine, so to speak. And she goes, wow, you sent the limo for me on our wedding day? And she gets in and she says, oh, this is the best. Look, there's even, you know, there's even like a mini bar in here. I can't believe it. So she's all impressed by it. <laughs> and then, and then she's arriving at the wedding. And what happens out of the woods? What happens out of the woods? Solomon rolls up in his own limo and entourage. And he's like, baby, did you think I only had one? I got, I got plenty. I got plenty. I'm Solomon. I'm the king. This is our day. This is our day. And I'm not just taking care of you, but I'm taking care of our day together. And so he rides up in this palanquin, this portable, ornate couch for carrying important people. And notice how beautiful it is. Verse 10, there's pillars of silver, supports of gold, a seat of purple. The, the maiden was impressed not only with the opulence of the palanquin, but especially that she shared all these symbols of authority and prestige with her beloved. Solomon shared his best with his maiden. Let me tell you something. Solomon's best was pretty good. Every husband has to think, how can I share my best with my wife? And you know, sometimes the best you have to give her is simply your attention, your heart, your affection, your grace towards her. But she really wants to share it with you. I'll never forget studying Ephesians chapter 5, that magnificent passage on marriage where the Apostle Paul talks about 
the, the role of the wife and the role of the husband. And he makes a remarkable emphasis upon the oneness between husband and wife. And, and this is the same principle we see illustrated very powerfully here. Everything that Solomon, the beloved, has, he gives and he shares unto his maiden. All the power, all the prestige, all the property, everything, it's all theirs together. There's a oneness there. I never forget reading the best commentary I've ever read. No, the best marriage book I've ever read. Now, I'm so weird that for me, the best marriage book I've ever read is a commentary on the, the letter to Ephesians. But it's amazing. And what it is, it's the sermons of Dr. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones going through that Ephesians passage. And there's one section where he's talking about the oneness between a husband and wife and what God wants for that. And he says something that I think is so insightful. He says, wives desire this oneness by instinct. It's just wired within them to long for this oneness. He said, husbands, they have to learn it. And, and you see so often... Again, every relationship's different. I'm not going to act like every marriage relationship is exactly the same. But in general, I certainly find this to be true. That there's a longing within every wife, just like this maiden, to have this reassurance for a husband. We're one. Everything I am, everything I will be, everything I have, my past, my present, my future, my destiny, all that, it's ours together. I'm never going to abandon you. We're together in this till the end. There's something within a maiden that longs for that. And here the Song of Solomon shows it so poetically, so powerfully, so beautifully being fulfilled as the two limos pull up to the wedding. By the way, he also wanted to show in this, by the opulence of the entourage and by the muscles of the 60 valiant men, he wanted to show two things to the maiden. He wanted to make it clear to everybody, I can provide for you and I can protect you. And those two fundamental things strike so powerfully at the root of any relationship that it's important that a man be able to communicate to his wife, I can provide for you and I can protect for you. That the, obviously the protection is shown in the armed men, that the provision is shown in the opulence of Solomon's entourage. Now, of course, Solomon couldn't protect and provide for the maiden until he could protect and provide for himself. Then they could have a shared life, a oneness with whatever, whatever they had together in the future. This idea of protection and provision is why a boy has to grow up and become a man before he can be a good husband. And why the process for preparing to be a good husband and, and, and becoming a good husband is good for maturing men. I thank the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that I got married young. Now, I, I'm not trying to say what is the path for everybody. Look, that's, that's between you and God. But I know for God's plan for my life, it helped me grow up because we need to have that thing. And it's, it's a beautiful process for maturing men into being the kind of protectors and providers that God wants us to be in this world. By the way, it also shows us that the maiden respected and honored her beloved. She saw his strength and authority as a good thing, not as a threatening thing. When he thought of her, excuse me, when she thought of his strength, she wasn't threatened by it. Do you know why? Because she was so assured that it was her strength also. It'll never be used against me, never. But it'll always only be used for me because it's our strength together. So verse 11, we'll close with this verse. It says, see King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. 
When Solomon was anointed and recognized as king, even before the death of his father David, the high priest presided over the ceremony, not his mother Bathsheba. So we think, we gather from that, when it's talking about the crown that Bathsheba, his mother, put on his head, it wasn't the crown to reign. It was probably the custom that they had in that day that every groom was considered a king and every bride was considered a queen. And they put a symbolic bridal crown upon them both. So again, this is sort of the crown of joy and gladness. It fits in well with the rabbinic traditions that a bride and a bridegroom are considered a royal couple on the day of their wedding. But I'll tell you, there's something very sad about this. And I cannot read the Song of Solomon without my heart and my mind soaring with, with the glory of it. I mean, you're almost like, man, we're at a high altitude here. You know, it's, the, the air's thin up here. Man, this, this is high stuff. But man, at that high altitude, I look down, and you know what I see down in the valley below? I see Solomon, who through his own sin and recklessness, if he ever lived the happiness of this relationship, it was only for a brief time and it was very soon that his heart was led astray to other women and to other gods. There's a bizarre tragedy in this book even in the midst of its glory. And we just take a step back and we say, Lord, on the one hand, yes, God, I want to live at that high altitude. I want to enjoy this. I, I know this sets forward an ideal picture that not even Solomon himself enjoyed it. If he enjoyed it for very long, if he enjoyed it at all, it wasn't for very long. Yes, it's a very idealized picture, but Lord, I want as much of it as I can possibly have before you. And, and, I want it to last. I don't want my heart to be drawn astray or corrupted. But on this day, it's all good. Verse 11, the end of it again. On the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart, it was a glad wedding because their love was real. The love was passionate, but it was also pure. It was restrained into the proper channels. And this principle made it a glad day, not only for the maiden and the beloved, but also for everyone. Everyone. And so what do we see next time? We see the wedding day and, honestly, next time, the wedding night. That's in chapter 4. Look, relationship-wise, for those of us who are married or marriage is on the horizon, you think about it someday for your life, think about the importance of oneness in the marriage relationship. Ask God to build it. Ask God to keep it. Ask God to deepen it. But then think about the other aspect as well. Think about the spiritual aspect. It really is true that if we feel like there's been any distance in our own relationship with Jesus, how does he call out to us? He says, you come find me. Come and find me. Come and seek after me. I'm not going to force myself upon you. You come and search me out, just like the maiden did her beloved. Father, this is our prayer. We see such a powerful book as this, Lord. We see it operating on so many levels. We see, Lord, it speaking very plainly and pointedly to, to married couples and those who will be married. It's like, wow, this, this is an amazing guide to relationship. But Lord... In its spiritual principle, it speaks to every person in this room, everyone. And so, Jesus, uh, we ask that on every level you would allow the truth of this glorious book to sink into our heart and life. Thank you, Lord, for this. And help us to worship you. <laughs> you know, Lord, we think of just the sense of gladness that attended this wedding of Solomon and 
Even though the ceremony has not yet begun, um, there's joy in the air. So we rejoice in you. You are a God. You are a Savior. We have so much to praise you for. So help us to do it, Lord, and to bring you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.